again, I'd like to thank Bante I'm here for the opportunity. Uh, today I wanted to give a short Dhamma talk on Samavayama. Uh, Samavayama is the sixth step in the Noble uh, Eightfold Path. Um, and in my experience, um, this factor of the path uh, kind of gets uh, overlooked. And when it gets explained, it's usually about uh, like just striving, kind of like just putting effort. Um, but when we look at what uh, the Buddha says in the suttas, he explains to us that this uh, this step, this factor, is divided into four parts. Samvara, Pahana, Bhavana, Anurakkana. So... Also, uh, Samavayama is known as the uh, Chattari Patana, uh, the four strivings. First one, Samvara. Samvara is a very important practice. Samvara means uh, to restrain or protect. Actually, one of the first uh, trainings that I'm a bhikkhu has to undergo in the beginning of their training is called uh, Indriya Sambara. Indriya means the senses, typically the five senses, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, listening. Sambara, to protect our senses. Why? The Buddha says that we need to protect the mind um, from unwholesome states arising in the mind when they're not present, right? So our mind gets uh, stimulated or reacts to uh, different experiences, different stimulus from the environment. Something might come in contact with our eye, with our ear, with our nose, with our mouth, and with our body. And uh, due to that contact, we get a pleasant or unpleasant feeling, and that either leads to uh, desiring it or having an aversion, uh, wanting it, clinging to it, attaching to it, or hating it and wanting to get rid of it and push it away. So in order to protect our mind from being disturbed, from being perturbed by things in the environment that might um, cause or condition an unwholesome state in our mind, we need to be very vigilant when it comes to our senses. We need to protect our senses from those things which might uh, trigger an unwholesome state in our mind. That is the first training, samvara. So the, I think this is a very important training for our time because of technology, social media, entertainment. It is so easy for us to be triggered by looking at something or listening to something. I can imagine it being more difficult in an agrarian society when some small little village today, when you don't have that much access to a lot of information. Maybe, you know, only your seeing your neighbor or your, you know, one of your family members uh, might trigger you, might bother you. But nowadays, it's so easy to get distracted and have unwholesome states, greed, hatred, delusion arise in the mind because we carry it in our pockets all the time. So we need to be very careful about what we pay attention to, what we see, what we listen, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch. This is actually the first step in samadhi training because samavayama, right effort, is the first of the steps of, of samadhi in the Noble Eightfold Path, followed by samasati, right mindfulness, and uh, samma samadhi, uh, right concentration. So usually the Eightfold Path is divided into three parts, wisdom, uh, morality, or behavior, and samadhi, meditation or concentration. And the first step is first to practice samvara, to protect your senses. Second step, pahana. Pahana, the Buddha says, is that when an unwholesome state does arise in a mind, 
you get rid of it, you abandon it, you eliminate it, you throw it away. So here, the Buddha officer offers us many ways uh, to eliminate an unwholesome state. There is a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Vitaka Santana Sutta. Vitaka means thought or state of mind. Santana means to calm. The discourse on calming thoughts. And here the Buddha says, when an unwholesome thought arises in the mind, uh, one replaces it with a wholesome thought. So we don't allow ourselves to entertain, to fester, to ruminate, to fantasize on these unwholesome, unskillful states. As soon as we recognize an, un an unwholesome, unskillful state, we, we try to get rid of it by replacing it with a wholesome state. The Buddha also gives us four other ways to do it, but uh, I don't want to go through that whole discourse. I just want to explain the principle of elimination, getting rid of this unwholesome state. The Buddha also gives a very important example to what degree we should want to eliminate unwholesome states when they arise in the mind. Because, you know, we might indulge in unwholesome states. Maybe our boss or our superior yeah, does something that we don't agree with and we might have some fantasy about revenge or getting back at them or them being hurt. And we, we think, well, that's fine because I'm not really doing anything. Or we might have some sort of uh, sexual fantasies about someone else's partner or some celebrity on TV. And, well, that's fine because I'm not actually doing it. But uh, the Buddha taught us that there's three types of kamma, three types of uh, intentional actions, mental, verbal, and bodily. So even just entertaining those thoughts, you're already creating unskillful, unwholesome karma. So the Buddha said, we need to think about these thoughts like a beautiful person in the prime of their life, a person of noble standing, a very proud person, a very wealthy person, educated person, who's covered in jewelry and beautiful scents. And imagine if someone were to put the dead carcass of an animal on that person. How would that person feel upon noticing that they have a dead carcass of an animal on their body? Well, that person would like freak out and throw it away right away because they don't want it. So in a similar way, when an unwholesome state arises in the mind, we need to see the danger in it and not entertain it and replace it with a wholesome state. For example, if you either fear hatred or fear, you can, you can replace it with metta, loving kindness. If you uh, feel cruelty or violence in the mind, you can replace it with karuna, compassion. If you feel a bit uh, jealous or resentful, you can practice it. You can replace it with mudita, altruistic joy. Right? And there's many, a long list of ways that we can do this. And that's the second step in the meditation training. The third step is the one which we are all very familiar with, bhavana. Bhavana means meditation to cultivate, to develop. Here the Buddha says, when there isn't a wholesome state present in the mind, one makes an effort to bring about a wholesome state in the mind. And usually when the Buddha talks about this in the suttas, he talks about the sattabhojanga, the seven factors of awakening. First one being sati, mindfulness. So when there isn't either a whole, uh, unwholesome state, when the mind is just kind of blank, not really doing anything, we need to make an effort, we need to strive to bring about a wholesome state in the mind, starting with sati, mindfulness. Then going to Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of phenomena or states, which just means noticing if something is wholesome or unwholesome. Then we make an effort, we strive to bring about vidya, energy, strength in the practice, mental strength. Then we make an effort to bring uh, piti, joy in the mind. We make an effort then to bring pasadi, which means like relaxation or tranquility. Then we make an effort to bring about samadhi, usually translated as concentration. 
And then we make an effort to bring about uh, upekka, equanimity. This is bhavana. So there's many different ways to practice bhavana. But the important thing is that no matter which kind of meditative practices we're doing, we are working on developing these seven factors of awakening. This is the third right effort or right striving. Then finally, we have probably the most difficult one, which is anurakena, uh, maintenance, or to keep, to keep, to continue, to keep it going. So it's not enough to, you know, come to a beautiful place like this with beautiful people, very serene, very quiet, very nice, uh, and practice bhavana for 20, 30 minutes uh, once a week. In the similar way that if you wanted to make some, you know, dietary changes or some um, physical changes in your body through exercise, it wouldn't be enough to just do the routine 20 minutes or one hour once a week. You wouldn't get the results that you that you would expect. It or to learn a language, if you wanted to learn a new language, just practicing 20 minutes once a week, it's gonna take a long time, or it may not even happen. So when if we want to see results and cultivate these seven factors of awakening, it's something that we need to continue. Even in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the Buddha says from the moment that uh, at all times one must be established in sati, mindfulness, at all times. That means from the moment that we wake up to when we go to sleep, whether walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, at all times, developing the first factor of awakening at least, sati, maintaining the practice in everything that we do. It's very difficult, but it is possible. So, samavayama means right effort. It's also known as uh, the chataripatana, which means the, the four uh, strivings. First one is sambara, to protect your senses, indriya sambara. Second is pahana, to eliminate. We eliminate an unwholesome thought or state in the mind by replacing it with a wholesome state. The third one is bhavana, to meditate. We develop the seven factors of awakening. Uh, mostly we do this through the practice of satipatthana, anapanasati. And then we have uh, anurakana, which means to keep it going, keep this practice going, keep developing wholesome states as much as possible all the time. So if you, were, if you notice here, we actually have the two following steps included within this practice. The development of the satapojanga is samasati, which is the practice of Satipatthana, the seventh step in the Noble Eightfold Path, is included within the sixth step. Sama Samadhi, concentration or jhana, is also included in here because we have the development of the seven factors of awakening. We have, sat we have uh, Samadhi and Upekka, which are also found in uh, Sama Samadhi. So when we come at this practice of meditation, and when we try to understand it through this lens of the Eightfold Path, uh, we need to have a more integrated view of meditation. Not that um, focusing on sama sati, a mindfulness practice or a concentrative practice, but really see that all these things are just different dimensions, and, you know, different perspective, different angles of the same practice. And if you want to... Uh, develop one of these, uh, you need to develop all of them together. And even just to develop right effort, sama vayama, first uh, you need to also work on your behavior. Sama vacha, sama kamanta, sama ajiva. Right speech, right actions, and right behavior. If we're not mindful of our behavior, then when we meditate, all those unwholesome actions of the past and words and thoughts will arise in the mind and disturb us. So we need to uh, change our behavior in order so, uh, for when, when we sit down to do meditation, it's a lot easier to calm the mind and get into a good meditation and not be perturbed about all the things that we feel remorseful or guilty or shameful about in the past. And that also depends on wisdom. To practice right efforts, samabayama, we need to develop our wisdom which is uh, samaditi and samasankapa. Uh, uh, right understanding means, basically most of the time, there's many ways to talk about it, but the Buddha says the 
Four Noble Truths is one way of understanding, um, having right understanding, Sammaditi. And Samma Sankapa is like the right motivation or right way to think, which means uh, having a motivation or a way of thinking which uh, focuses on uh, renunciation, we can say letting go, uh, uh, loving kindness, benevolence, and uh, nonviolence, compassion. So when we want to develop our meditation practice, we need to look at all these other previous steps um, in the Noble Eightfold Path in order to be able to develop our meditative practice, in order to be able to develop right effort, uh, in order to be able to change our behavior and our understanding and our way of thinking. So I just kind of wanted to share with you this basic outline and wanted actually to leave a lot more time for questions and answers because, you know, what I told you is something that you can just Google and find out for yourself. I mean, that's not a much benefit. But I think there's more benefit in, you know, looking at the nuances or like, how do I do this in my actual meditation or in my everyday life? Or maybe you can share some of your struggles and maybe I have some experience with those struggles too and I can tell you how to apply this right effort into your daily life. So Bante, I don't know if that's okay if we can move on to that part now. <laughs> Those of you who don't know Polly, Ajahn Kodolo's translated sadhu as yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. So, way to go. <laughs> so, thank you, Bonte. Um, we do have a chance now for people to speak or bring up anything they'd like to discuss or talk about um, on the live stream. You can type in your questions or bring them up in the chat and others can raise their hand and let us just run a mic over to you or mindfully quickly walk a mic over to you. And if you would say your name before you speak, that would be great. Um, I have a first question, Bonte. <laughs> um, could you just speak a bit uh, about, I know you get asked this often, but your path into robes. Bonte. Uh, so, um, I, I came across Buddhism at a very early age. Um, I grew up in a very, in the very diverse neighborhood to this day of Koreatown in downtown Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, you know, when I walk down the street, even to this day, you know, most, uh, most of the businesses are Asian owned and, uh, that was always, uh, there around me and also my parents, um, Although they were both uh, Latinos, uh, they were very uh, always interested in in Asian culture. And actually, the first school I ever went to was a Korean daycare. I was the only non-Korean. I didn't know at that time. But then when I looked at the class picture, I was like, oh, someone's different here. And it was me. Uh, so then, um, you know, um, growing up in, in that area and in, near the Hollywood area, because then a couple years later we moved to Hollywood. Um, I had a lot of friends, like Thai friends, Vietnamese friends, and uh, I had some curiosity, and I would ask them about Buddhism. But, you know, uh, new generation to America doesn't really know that much about their tradition, and they would say, oh, you know, we just go like, we light candles, and we give incense for our ancestors, and that's Buddhism. And I was like, oh, so you just like do this ritual, and that's it? You know, what did the Buddha teach? Go get a book or something, you know, like you'll find out. And I was like, okay. Uh, but then when I got into high school, I started reading a lot of studying like uh, the Greek philosophers. And then I was like, well, you know, maybe the East has something to offer too. So then I started picking up some uh, Buddhist philosophy books, Buddhist books. And the first one I read was The Joy of Living and Dying in Peace by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it was kind of just like a good summary or introduction to the Eightfold Path. And then I was like, ah, oh, yes, that's that's what I've been looking for. But um, I was still too immature <laughs> to actually follow through. It was like, oh, it sounds nice, but to do it, 
I'm, I wasn't ready. And then actually in, in high school, my high school sweetheart, she was, she was a Vietnamese Buddhist too. So I, I learned something about Buddhism um, through her family, but her family also was mostly focused on just like, you know, uh, going to the temple and uh, giving money and offering incense and lighting candles. And there wasn't much, anything else really to it. Um, but then when I was, uh, when I had joined the Air Force, right before I left to basic training, uh, I went to a Thai temple, Wat Thai in L.A., uh, and then um, I tried to talk to the monks there, but nobody knew English. <laughs> so they gave me a book about the Eightfold Path again. There's like around 30 monks there all the time. So it's not like, you know, like a small temple. It's a big temple and there's still no one knew any English or there wasn't nobody that knew was there. Uh, so then I went again the following week. And again, like no one could talk to me and they didn't have any programs either so then uh, I just kept studying the book and I left to basic training so then I kept reading Buddhist books for like the next eight years and finally I said man you know like enough's enough like I just gotta like I just gotta find a way I gotta find my own way so I I went on to Google and I put like Buddhist temples and I and then I found uh, one where they said they had an English program and it was uh, this little house Actually, around the corner in the San Fernando Valley, because I moved to the Valley later, San Fernando Valley in L.A., and um, I went there, and I knocked on the door, and I said, oh, you have a Friday meditation program? They said, yes, yeah, 7 o'clock, and then they closed the door. <laughs> and I was like, man, like, this is not working out for me again. Like, so hard. Uh, but I showed up. I showed up. Um, and then when I showed up there, I was surprised to see that half of the people there, like, six to eight people were all like middle aged or older Latinos, you know, men and women. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, very different. And there was no Asian people besides the monks. Um, and so I kind of just stayed there. And um, after like two or three months, my future teacher, Bhante Puniji, uh, showed up. And I showed up there for meditation, but I didn't know that there was going to be a talk. And they told me to stay. And, um, you know, my teacher, Bhante Puniji, he was very, um, like, academic. <laughs> and then uh, the first Dhamma talk he gave, it just went over my head. And I was like, oh, wow, that's too much. And uh, then the second time I went, uh, this one Latina woman who's, like, uh, very, uh, been going to the temple for over 25 years, she uh, asked a question, like, so, you know, what is the best thing we can, like, in, we can do to kind of, like, help us practice this uh, what can we do to get out of this samsara and dukkha what's your advice and then my teacher said well you know uh the the fastest or the easiest way to do it if you really want to is you know to take up robes to become a, a monk and then something clicked in my head at that time you know i still wasn't ready but some i remember hearing that and saying yeah like that makes sense but to be honest at that time, I was living my best life. Like, <laughs> I was having a lot of fun. <laughs> I wasn't a very spiritual person, you know? I was of the world. And uh, and so I wasn't ready. But uh, I had got this. Then I was about to be sent on my third deployment to Afghanistan. And then I said, you know what? How about I, how about I practice this Dhamma in Afghanistan and see what happens? Everything and try to live like a monk too. So I also practiced, you know, like, uh, brahmacharya while I was out there too and because um, you might think well you know you can't do those things a lot of things are happening over there <laughs> that you wouldn't think are happening um, so people started noticing over there too that I had changed and I felt different too and then when I came back I said you know what this dhamma really helped me those six months I was there in Afghanistan and like I would really want to go deeper so then I went on a meditation retreat and then I had a really good retreat, like really amazing. <laughs> and actually, I didn't want to leave it. But I had already had a plan to trip with my military friends to go to Spain for uh, two and a half weeks. And I know they wouldn't be happy if I didn't go with them. So I ended up going with them. I came back and then I went to my temple and I asked for ordination and the monks just laughed. Then I was like, oh, I want to become a monk. <laughs> Very nice. And then see you later. And... Uh, 
Then the next Friday, I told them, no, I was serious. Like, I want to become a monk. They're like, oh, okay, okay, you keep studying. Just study, study, study. And then after three months, finally, they said, okay, you know, we're going to, like, kind of see and, like, uh, what you're doing and kind of check on you for the next couple months to see if you're a good candidate to be a monk. Then almost about, like, nine months from when I first asked them, uh, I was giving a ride to one of the monks to our re meditation center, and the chief monk, and he said, you can come and stay with us now, just like out of nowhere. Like, we weren't talking the whole way. He just said that, and then we kept driving. He didn't say anything else. Um, so then I had to, like, you know, like, get out of the military. I had to get rid of get rid of my car. I had to sell my house. I had to break up with my girlfriend. I had to do all these things. Uh, she was very supportive, though. She never said, like, anything to stop or don't do it. And then I told her, like, would you want me to stay? And she says, no, you go. Yeah, that's what you want to do. I don't want to be the one that holds you back. So I thank her for that, for being very supportive. And although she cried when she was telling me this, you know, but she was very supportive. Um, my mom also cried. She went to my ordination, Samanera ordination. And, you know, she's a traditional Mexican Catholic woman. She didn't know what was going on. But uh, she started crying. And then when I saw her cry, I started to cry too. But I was bowing so people couldn't see, you know, and my face was down. So it's easier for me to cry. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I've been, I was three years of Samanera at that temple. And then in 2018, I went to uh, Sri Lanka and got ordained at Maharagama Bhikkhu Training Center. I, my teacher, also my teacher, Bhante Puniji, was there. And we talked for like two hours. And then three days later, he passed away in Sri Lanka on the full moon uh, of, the, um, of the beginning of the rains retreat. Yeah. On that full moon, he passed that night in his sleep. Um, and then he told me something that day. He says, you know what? Um, I, in his experience, he said the best way to kind of like throw a large net in the West to get people to kind of like begin to understand what Buddhism is about is we need to speak their language. And he, he, was, he grew up speaking English, so he wasn't talking about English, although he was Sri Lankan. He says... Like according to their the what they value, and he says, well, they value like science a lot, you know. So we need to speak to them in that way as a bridge uh, uh, for them to understand. So he says you should like uh, you know study psychology. And I, I was already done with school; I didn't want to go back to school. But uh, since he passed away, then I said, well, like that was the last thing he told me. So then, <laughs> so then, like uh, two or three months later, I signed up for a master's degree in counseling psychology. And then I was lucky enough that when I started there, they also started doing um, uh, research into mindfulness. So I've been doing over a year and a half uh, qualitative research, like uh, introducing mindfulness into uh, uh, graduate studies and undergraduate studies, uh, and also introducing uh, mindfulness electives for uh, clinicians to help them also, you know, for their own self uh, self care. Uh, so yeah, that's basically. Like, in a nutshell, the short version of my story, Bante. <laughs> we have one question from uh, Robert. Uh, Bante, how can I approach sport, and more specifically, competitive sport, in a way that is more wholesome? Yeah, that's difficult because it's set up in like this dichotomous way, right? Where there's winners and there's losers. And um, I mean, there's fame that also plays into it. There's wealth that plays into it. There's so many factors. It's, you know, I don't think there's one thing that I can say that can, you know, give you a very clear way uh, uh, to approach it. But you know, just try to do the best that you can do in every moment. Um, try to definitely practice mindfulness and practice metta, uh, loving, kind, uh, loving kindness and compassion. Um, but, you know, like if you wanted to take it, if I wanted to give you like some extreme advice, you know, like very, very extreme advice would be to do something else. <laughs> right? Just do something else. It might be difficult, you know, like sometimes people come to me, especially with a lot of relationship problems. And then I'm like, well, have you considered just breaking up? Oh, uh, that's like the worst thing, right? Like, well, 
you don't seem very happy, you know? Like, why are you going to stay in a place that's not good for you, right? So even the Buddha told us, right, like in right livelihood, not to sell poisons or weapons or do things that harm others. And, but sometimes we forget if there's some about ourselves, if, if, if our job or our hobbies are harming ourselves. If something's harming us, then we also need to avoid it, right? Uh, so they, you know, maybe if you're like playing volleyball or tennis, you know, <laughs> you're not harming yourself to that degree. But you should consider, you know, where are you at in your life right now? And where is your Dhamma practice at right now? And where do you, where do you want to take it right now? And what's your ultimate goal in this life or in the future? So you just kind of have to look at your own life and like reassess your values. What do you want out of this life? What do you want out of this moment? And then try to do the best you can to help you achieve that goal. And that's going to look different for every person because there's so many factors that play into everyone's life. There really isn't something that we can say like, well, just do this, you know, like, oh, like we do for meditation, right? If you feel fear, oh, practice loving kindness. It's very simple. But for something like this, I think it's, it's so many layers. There's so many layers that are there that it would require like a one-on-one -on -one talk for like an hour to really get deep and give you a good answer and uh, not just, you know, throw something out there that someone else, they, they might not work for someone else that's in a similar situation. Hi, Moffat. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I uh, particularly got something out of the idea of um, trying to imagine myself being dignified and having a carcass mm -hmm. attach and the, the wisdom of seeing it as, a, as a, a burden or a carcass that I could then throw off. I think um, for me, I pictured the, the carcass as uh, sort of uh, fear fear of the future, fear of security, and was wondering if you had uh, more thoughts on, like, if you see the wisdom of, you know, how, how it's not helping you to feel this, um, how to keep it from, you know, it's like reattaching it to self all the time. <laughs> and the, and the, I love that, like, how do you throw it off? But uh, in my real life, it keeps reappearing. Yeah, I think first we need to kind of see what the results of holding onto that are, you know? We kind of be like, we kind of see like, well, if I keep this, what's going to happen to me, to others, and to me and others? And once you wisely consider this and you see that it leads to unwholesomeness, then that that urge or, or, or that motivation to get rid of it is like automatic, right? Like if, I don't know, like if you find some poop on you, right? Like... You don't have to be like, oh, should I take it off or not? <laughs> you just take it off, right? Uh, so in a similar way, once you recognize kind of like the dirtiness of, of the unwholesome act, like how it can lead to your suffering and the suffering of others, it's just like intuitive, like right? Like that, com that sense of like uh, self-compassion and compassion towards others uh, just comes up in a very fierce way and you just reject it. So in the beginning, it does take us to be mindful of what's actually happening and then be able to discern if it's wholesome or unwholesome. But then usually once we see it as unwholesome, then it's easy to get rid of it. You know, like anything, like if you touch fire, it burns you, you don't think about it, you just pull your hand away. But you, we need to first wisely uh, consider it and pay attention to it. But uh, I think that's the difficult thing because many of us don't want to look at ourselves and our patterns and our thoughts and we kind of take them for granted, especially if our culture supports it. So we don't ever analyze our words, our actions, our behaviors, and all these other things. But if we do take time to analyze everything, every single aspect of our life, we'll be able to discern what's good or not. I was just going to say, I think that I, some part of me thinks the fear is what's going to protect me. So it's not that I don't see the burden of it. I see that, okay, well, it's a necessary uh, carcass because then I'll be safe if I'm afraid. But I am. I, I appreciate the encouragement to look more clearly at that and see, is that, is that true? Yeah, so you know, most of the things that we do were useful for us at some point. These are strategies that we learned. So maybe in the past it, it was a good way to, or the best that you could do at that time, 
but now you have so much more experience and different tools. So that might not be the best tool for the new project that you're working on, that fear. Just on um, that same note of what Bonte is saying, um, one very useful technique is to, you know, so many of those patterns got developed when we were children to survive. And if you can just imagine inviting that child in like that little Moffat, you know, and uh, you just really sincerely thanking her for helping you get through the times you needed to and then say, you know, I've, I have a different way of dealing with this now and, you know, kind of letting them just rest. Um, I think that visualization can be really helpful. Um, another helpful thing to remember is, is Ajahn Chah said about 80% of the practice is knowing we should let go of something and not being able to. So it's just, it, this takes a while. These are such old habits. Um, and, you know, as with all the leaf blowers of the world, uh, when these things come into your mind, you know, it's one thing to kind of shy away from them. It's another thing to imagine that your consciousness is expanding to include it as well. And um, to understand that, like, a lot of loving kindness is just really being able to feel that um, sense of, of dukkha, of, of pain in, internally. And with something like fear or anger, often it's the impulses to spread metta outwards, whereas often you just, the real manifestation of metta is to really have compassion for yourself and the pain of of how painful anger is like compassion towards yourself is where it needs to go appropriately um and the final thing which is partly what bonte is saying as well i think around some of the sports things is sometimes you do get into one of those cycles where you just know you sh you need to let go of something and you keep kind of uh negotiating with yourself and we do have a tool in in the buddhist tool belt called aditana which means determination and that's where you just say it's kind of the sword of wisdom where you just say enough is enough i'm not going to drink anymore i'm not going to do this and um i think i've mentioned this before but some people will write a check to the political party they hate and give it to a friend you know and say that if i break this aditana you need to mail the check so it's a useful thing as well Thank you, Bonte. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, in that space where, let's say, anger arises, and you're saying eventually or at some point, ideally sooner than later, replace it with something like metta. Um, but in that space between when it has arisen and the metta, is there, well, it, w w what's kind of the right way to go about it? Because I find a lot of benefit from, um, you know, contemplating why it has arisen, uh, like maybe watching its uh, imper impermanent nature. And then once I realize that it's happening in the mind, then there's a recognition that, you know, metta is a better alternative. So is there a, is there a value in that kind of uh, contemplation, given that it has arisen, or should I immediately try to replace it with metta? So um, in order to recognize that even anger has arisen, there has to be a level of mindfulness, right? So right there, we already have the practice of satipatthana already beginning. And then to see that that anger is uh, unskillful, unwholesome, then you have the seven fact, the second factor of the of the seven factors of awakening, which is investigation of dhamma, right? And then in that second factor, when you rec recognize that this is unwholesome, then you would try to um, replace it with a wholesome state, right? So there is a space, there is that space, you know, uh, from when it arises to when you're able to discern its unwholesomeness, right? So in that space, uh, we need to practice the highest austerities or you know the hardest practice of all the buddha said uh uh kanti paraman tapotiti kani banam uh paraman badati buddha like uh um patience and tolerance are the highest practices or the highest austerities right so this practice of replacing an unwholesome state with the wholesome one is not a practice of aversion you know where you try to run away from it uh it's a 
it's it's a practice of not letting your train of thought be taken in by that thought, by that state of mind, right? So you see you're going down that road and you're like, well, my mindfulness is not enough. You know, just being mindful of it is not enough. I've been sitting here for, you know, two or three minutes just thinking about like murdering my neighbor or something like that, right? So mindfulness, mindfulness is, is a neutral state of mind. We can use it for good or for bad. So then when you notice that the, the uh, mindfulness on its own is not powerful, then you have to kind of do something about it and not just sit with anger or sadness for like an hour in a row. Like that's like self-mortification. You know, like what Buddha said, we had to avoid the two extremes of indulgence and mortification and the meditation. Uh, we kind of, there's this kind of macho attitude <laughs> sometimes about it, right? Like with physical pain or with emotional uh, uh, disturbances or mental disturbances. We're like, well, I just got to, tough it out, you know, and just be like, no, 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 like, be nice. Practice the loving kindness towards yourself. So when you do see, you know, some anger or sadness or some unwholesome state come up and uh, in, during your mindfulness practice, there comes to a place where you're reaching your threshold. And at that time, you know, it'd be very skillful to, to uh, uh, like a loving kindness practice. But it's definitely not like a uh, reactionary practice or an, a, pra a practice of aversion. As soon as something comes up, you try to run away. Uh, we need to fully comprehend it, see it, discern whether it's wholesome or unwholesome, and uh, and then replace it. So we do need to have some patience and tolerance to kind of to know how it arose. Right, that's the important thing. We need to know what are the causes and conditions for anger to arise. What are the causes and conditions? for sadness to arise. And we only get that if we're able to stay with it for a bit. Hello, uh, my name is Hiram. Uh, thank you, Bonte, for coming and uh, giving that Dhamma talk. Um, in your introduction, I heard you have a Latino outreach. Um, and uh, I would imagine some young people come and ask questions. So uh, first I'll give a, a little dialogue and then the question afterwards. So um, there's a, I hate to bring this up. There's a network story, Netflix, that has Game of Thrones. There was a terrible ending and uh, me and my kid were looking at it, and she was like, oh, that sucks. That was eight seasons, and it wasn't a great ending. And I was like, that's a great ending, because that's how life is. You know, good things, bad things happen, and then you live life on. So my question is, uh, how do you relate to younger people and bringing them into Buddhism and accepting cause and conditions, and then how to live how to live life, you know, accepting those conditions. That last part is the most difficult one. <laughs> uh, how to bring people into the Dhamma is a little bit, it's a little bit easier. Um, so one thing that I noticed, you know, at least in L.A. with most of the monasteries was that all the monks stay inside. They never go outside. And when they do, they're in a car. So nobody sees them. Like monks are invisible and Southern California has the largest uh, population of Buddhists and the most Buddhist temples in Southern California than in all the country, but it's like they're not around. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to walk everywhere and I'm on public transportation. I take the bus, I take the train, you know, I'm always walking places. And then when new people who are interested in Buddhism want to meet up with me, you know, I try to meet them at a coffee shop, you know, or something like that, like in a neutral space where they feel more comfortable or, you know, uh, or, or somewhere like in a park or at a train station. I try to meet people just like where you're at, you know, not just like psychologically, but actually physically, I'll try to meet you where you're at. And I think that's a good way because, uh, you know, there's so many barriers. One is like a cultural ethnic barrier. There's the religious barrier, right? Like, so there's a lot of barriers coming into the Dhamma. And there's a lot of barriers on the other side, like from being from a Latino family, a lot of like um, stigma about like 
you know, changing religions or even like looking at other religions or doing even like yoga or any kind of like meditation, you know, like there's a lot of stigma and taboo about it. So you kind of have to like bring it down to earth and meet and, and, and meet them where they're at. And actually most of the, most of my work is just like unexpected. Like some people will come up to me on the train and they'd be like, Hey man, like you a real Buddhist monk or what? You know? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a real Buddhist monk. They're like, so. And uh, actually, to, to, to be honest, like, I would say more than half of the people that interact with me on the streets are like gang members. They're like, hey, what's up, homie? Like, what's going on? What are you doing? You know, like, and they talk with me. I've had a couple just start crying in front of me because they share their difficult experiences with me. So I think... Uh, we just got to, it's just got to be like a person to person thing. It can't be like, oh, I got this awesome thing called Buddhism or meditation to share with you. It's just having that human connection. And then once they see that humanity in you, they're going to be interested in you. Like, okay, what do you, do? just like you would ask anyone else, like, what do you do for work? Do you have kids? Do you have family? And then once you get to that kind of level, then like, once they're that open, it's just easy to share, you know, just like with anyone else. So I think we just got to make it very normal. And, uh, the other part is difficult because I have a little sister. She's 19 and a little brother, and he's 17. And they think, you know, life just always has to be, like, fun. You know, right? Like, if life isn't fun, then things are horrible. Like, even neutral is horrible. You know, like, they always have to be on, like, like going places, doing all these things and sharing everything online. Um, and when things don't go their way, it's it's very, very difficult to kind of, Tell them that it's going to be okay. And one, because they don't want to hear it even. They don't even want to hear it. Uh, so I think a lot of it is 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 just like being there for them, you know? Just being there for them and just kind of waiting for them to mature, <laughs> you know? Because uh, I think as, as, as long as we're there for someone, um, uh, there's the opportunity for that person. If they do want to change or improve their life or do something about what's going on, they know where to go, you know? So I think just being available in general to anyone is like the best that we can do. And with young people, especially if you're someone like their parents or someone older, it's very difficult because there's like a power imbalance and they don't want any of that. You know, they want to be on equal ground and they're like, oh, you think I know everything and stuff like that. So I think it might be more useful if someone similar to their age might talk to them about it, you know, if you can find someone like that. Uh, but yeah, that's just, it's very difficult, you know, like, even though I'm a Buddhist monk, my sister don't care, right? She still calls me Ricky, and, like, she's, she don't care about anything. Um, and she'll bring up all the stuff I did in the past, too. Well, you used to go to parties, and you used to do this, and you used to do that. Now it's my turn, you know? So, like, there's really nothing I, I can really do. But I notice that when she does need help, she reaches out to me, and she calls me, you know? Like, for stuff she wouldn't call my mom or her or her dad for or other family members she's very sincere with me and she's very straight up even about the bad things she does she just tells me straight up and i'm like wow like that feels so good that my sister can trust me like that that she can just tell me something that she wouldn't feel comfortable telling other people because she knows i won't tell her like you shouldn't do that or this and that you know i'm just like okay so i think a lot of it's just just being there and then just kind of letting them work their way through it, which is painful for us too, you know? Like, we don't want to see them go through the same things that we did, so it's hard. But again, there we have to practice patience and tolerance, like the Buddha said, which is very difficult. My name's Adam. Um, this is kind of similar to another question that was asked, but um, oftentimes when I feel angry or upset with a person, um, it comes from some feeling of like hurt or betrayal. And I find it really difficult to try to just immediately replace that with meta without some kind of, um, communication or action and so I guess I'm wondering if there's a place for um, like communication within that process 
of like showing loving kindness to the person who may have hurt me by like explaining to them how that hurt me. Um, it also feels like sort of an important piece of compassion to myself in also feeling valid in that hurt. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if there's a place for that or if you would suggest putting more um, effort into just the mindfulness of the emotion itself. Thank you. So yes, there, there definitely is a place for it. But uh, I'd like to use uh, like a little uh, example here. You know, if this place would to go on fire, the first thing we want to do is turn off the fire and not launch an investigation of like all the causes and conditions that led to the fire. Like that happens after the fire. The firefighters then investigate like, okay, how did the fire happen? Was it electrical? Did someone set it up on purpose? So in the moment where you feel that fire of sadness, resentment, anger, et cetera, whatever unwholesome state, you need to extinguish it for your own well-being. Once you get that done, then yes, then it's the time to see how. What can you do to protect yourself from it happening in the future? And part of that might be to be able to communicate with other people, right? Like, well, you know, uh, when this happens, uh, I feel this way, right? And then if the person doesn't change their behavior, then it's just time to leave that person, right? If you can, if it's possible for you to you know, uh, separate yourself from that person. But uh, in the moment, you have to turn off the unwholesomeness. And then once you're in a place, a stable place, then it's time for you to go about all the other ways that you might, ha um, that you can handle that situation to feel some sort of like closure uh, about what's going on. But there definitely is a place and there should always be a place for holding people accountable and, you know, doing something outside is just not like, you know, well, this person robbed me, so I'm just going to practice loving kindness. You know, like, no, like, you need to run away if they, you see someone coming at you. And if they rob you, you need to call the police. And, like, there's all these things that you need to do, you know. But for when it comes to, like, your mental uh, self-care, then that's the time to apply the loving kindness. But that's, you know, I, I think we kind of have to... Like what I was getting at to earlier in the beginning when I said like a more like integrated practice, you know, like we can't just think about like, well, meditation is going to be the solution for everything, for all life's problems, formal meditation, you know, um, we need to kind of look at wisdom, behavior, meditation, and being in a community, having Kalyanamitas, the Buddha said that the spiritual path is impossible without Kalyanamitas, right? So without having this, you can't even practice the Dhamma. It's, it's not possible, right? So it's very important. So there's so many things. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, um, whatever seems like is the most wholesome thing to you at that time, try that. And then don't be stuck to that, you know, because then the next time that might not be as useful. So we kind of have to have this kind of dynamic practice. We're always ready to pull from the Dhamma, whatever works for us at that time, and not be so rigid about like, well, I, I'm just a... Uh, Vipassana practicers, so no matter what happens in the world, I'm just going to do Vipassana. Or I'm just a loving kindness metta practitioner. No matter what happens in the world, I'm just going to do metta because I'm loyal to this practice. Like, no. You know? Sometimes you got to do other things. And we just got to be very open to that. <laughs>